Well, welcome to our broadcast. My name is Father Thomas Stone. I'm the rector of Holy Cross Anglican Church. Um, so if you are following our live stream or our broadcasts, you might have noticed this past Sunday, the sixth Sunday after Trinity, we had a little problem. Uh, the stream was actually working and then, um, well, suffice to say, we lost the file uh, when we were getting ready to try to archive it. So to fill in this gap, I'm going to try doing something here. This maybe will become a new tradition, something we've done once before. And I'm just going to offer a personal uh, message here in this format. And we'll get posting this on the website uh, through our YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you for joining us, and I hope that this helps you to connect to us in a meaningful way and helps you in your walk with the Lord and to draw closer to him. thought I would just uh, talk briefly about uh, this past Sunday and uh, things happening in the parish and then offer a few prayers, uh, many of which are taken from the morning prayer service, but not all of them, and uh, uh, let you uh, uh, know about uh, my sermon for this past week. So um, it was a nice Sunday. It's so wonderful that we can all see each other again. Uh, it was rather hot on Sunday. <laughs> so I thank those brave souls who did uh, manage to turn out and make it. It was uh, one of those muggy days in western New York in the summer. And um, next week, we are planning on celebrating the Feast of St. James the Apostle. So I hope you can join us uh, for that Sunday. And if you're not in the area here, uh, hopefully we'll have the streaming uh, back online and working. And uh, so uh, thank you so much for watching our broadcasts and for connecting with us. And um, you know, please let me know uh, that you're out there. You can always email me at anglicanrev um, at gmail. That's anglicanrev, R-E-V, all one word. And, um, or uh, leave me a note on our website, uh, holycrossanglican.net. So, um, thank you once again, and I think I'd like to just uh, get into some prayers and then uh, one of our traditions in our uh, worship is to come before God acknowledging our sense of sin and being cleansed from that. So I'm going to begin with the prayer of general confession from morning prayer. If you are praying along with me, I encourage you to pray along with us now. And please forgive me as I look up and down. We haven't quite got all this with the camera figured out yet. And with my glasses, I don't quite work right, so I'm sorry if I'm looking at an odd angle. I just uh, do the best I can do here. So, uh, let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God, most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may ever hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Now, for those of you who have prayed this confession and truly repented, in accordance with our prayer book, I'm going to declare absolution. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins unto all those who, with hearty repentance and true faith, turn unto him, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us say together a prayer taught us by our Lord himself. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the collect for this past Sunday. O God, who hast prepared for those who love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love towards thee that we, loving thee above all things, may attain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of comfort, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, and whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all the assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, that all of our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority, wisdom and strength, strength to know and to do thy will. Pray this especially for not only the president, but all the members of Congress, the president's advisors, and the members of the Supreme Court, and our governor and state legislature. Fill them, Lord, with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Mighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the helpful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'm going to say the prayer for the whole state, of, for the all conditions of men, and include those on our parish prayer list. After I say those names, I'll pause, and perhaps uh, if you're following along and praying, you might um, add some intentions of your own. O oh God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving help unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who, are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, remembering especially those on our parish prayer list, Mary Kate, Holly, Linda, James, Fred, Rebecca, Hans and Marjorie, Martin, Tegan, David, Janet, Jean, Lynn, Goldie, Ronald, Mara, Bob, Persecuted Christians, Kathy, Walt, Wendy, those suffering from the coronavirus outbreak, especially Cindy, and Father Jim Long and his family in Indonesia, and any whom you would like to mention now.
that it may please thee, Lord, to comfort and relieve these according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings, and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. This we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Now for the reading, I'm just going to read the gospel selection for this Sunday, because this is what the sermon was based on. The gospel uh, for the sixth Sunday after Trinity is found in Matthew uh, chapter 5, beginning at verse 20 and running through verse 26. During our service, we read the King James Version, but for this uh, broadcast, I thought I would read from a, a modern translation called the ESV or the English Standard Version, a very well-regarded modern translation. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of old to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now please pray with me as I prepare for my sermon. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, O Lord, be always acceptable in thy sight. Amen. All right. Well, pardon me if I'm a little rough doing this. This is a sort of an unusual format or means or way for me to deliver a sermon, but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, please bear with me. Our gospel reading begins with an alarming challenge to the reader. For I tell you, Jesus declares in no uncertain terms, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. At first sight, this might seem like a pretty easy threshold to reach. How difficult can it be to exceed their righteousness when Jesus is so frequently criticizing them? He reserves some of his harshest criticism for these self-appointed guardians of the law, denouncing the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, at one point declaring them to be whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Jesus would hardly bother warning us if it were as easy as all that. And even the most cursory glimpse at the larger contents, context excuse me, banishes any such self-congratulatory thoughts. He is not giving us a flattering picture of how easy it should be to exceed the efforts of the religious experts. Rather, Jesus is challenging you to reach a level the most diligent students of the law could hardly imagine. He is not congratulating us on our superior moral morality, but showing us all how far we have fallen short of God's standards. The verses just before our selection begins contains a solemn warning against lightly dismissing God's law. Jesus declares that until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. For this reason, he continues, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
This sets the stage for his declaration that our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, men who are experts in the law and who had devoted their lives to the strictest observance of its tenets. It's a challenging standard and must have caught some of his listeners off guard. What is he up to now, you can imagine some of them thinking? Is Jesus now telling us that we have to live like these very men whose way of life he so frequently criticized? But the truth was even more disturbing, as we find when we continue on in this passage. For Jesus was not asking for a whole new level of dedication to the law. I'm sorry, Jesus was asking for a whole new level of dedication to the law. I told you I was having a little rough time with this format. Going beyond merely observing the law's formal requirements. Thus, for example... It is not enough for us to just refrain from actually murdering someone. For I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Similarly, we learn that even if we bite our tongues and to hold in the spiteful or contemptuous words that spring to mind, or even if we congratulate ourselves on avoiding that pretty co-worker, the anger and lust that we harbor in our hearts is itself a sin. Yes, we should not do such things. We should not insult one another or commit adultery. But God sees behind our masks, and the actions we take grow out of the attitudes and desires we harbor in secret. We must not only refrain from harming our neighbor, we must also stop wishing them harm. And if this seems an impossible standard, that is part of the point. Christ calls us to examine our conscience, not to drive us to despair, but that we may more fully realize how far the empire of sin has extended, how it has triumphed in our very hearts. We need to see our need of God. We cannot avail ourselves of the grace he so freely offers if we do not recognize that we need his help. Moments like these punctuate Jesus' teaching. For one of our greatest enemies is a kind of complacency that settles over us as we go about our daily lives. How often do we really worry about living up to God's standards? Jesus was fearless and uncompromising in criticizing the religious establishment of the day. But in today's passage, he is letting us know that we all have work to do. The Pharisees were like that kid who was always getting in trouble at school. But the rest of us, the kids with their noses quietly buried in some workbook, should not pat ourselves on the back for avoiding contention. For in Jesus' analysis, the rank and file have as much work to do as the corrupt and misguided leadership. In fact, it is easy for us now to dismiss the scribes and Pharisees because we are used to them being painted in an unflattering light. They frequently appear as antagonists in the gospel accounts, and Jesus' critique has become so much a part of our culture, we have even adopted the word pharisaical to refer to someone who is overly legalistic and hypocritical. But we should not lose sight of how respected they were in their own time. These were men who gave their lives to the study of the law and who committed themselves to obeying even the least of the law's injunctions. Furthermore, there existed then a popular school of thought which held that the Messiah would not usher in God's new kingdom until Israel offered perfect obedience to the law. Looked at in this light, the Pharisees could be seen as serving the Messiah's cause doing their part to bring about the fulfillment of the prophecies. We have forgotten how scandalous Jesus' attacks must have been. And when he turned around and told his audience that they had to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, that must have alarmed them even more. No one could hope to live up to such a standard. This might not seem like such a formidable expectation now that we've had many long centuries to get comfortable with the idea of God's grace and Christ, and are also very used to dismissing the scribes and the Pharisees. However, 
we would be wise to hang on to for just a moment some part of the wonder and consternation Jesus' first audience must have felt. For Jesus is challenging us with these words. And he wants us thinking long and deeply about the side of ourselves that only God can see. Jesus intended his words to sting a bit. They no longer smart because we no longer care. Looking at the church of our day, let alone our society at large, do you see many who are consumed with the need to live holy and righteous lives? Don't we instead tend to make excuses for our sins, if we even recognize the idea of sin at all? The culture has taught us to take a more therapeutic line. Values are strictly relative and are to be judged by how they make us feel. Absolutes like good and evil, right or wrong, are banished from our vocabulary. Instead, we think in terms of empowerment and affirmation. We teach self-actualization while the ancient church demanded self-examination. Their way was wiser, for we can only fix something if we know it is broken. We let him, God will show you the stains on your soul, just as surely as Jesus challenged that crowd to think about what they were really like inside despite their ability to keep up respectable appearances as obedient Jews living in God's favor. God does this not to torture you or make you unhappy, but to show you your need of God's healing touch. Only with a realistic picture of our own faults can we obey Paul's injunction to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In the colic for today, we pray that God might pour into our hearts such love toward thee, that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises, which exceed all that we can desire. This prayer beautifully expresses our deep-seated need for God. Our love needs to be awoken, and I think that often the problem is that our lives become so cluttered with the things of this world, we forget where our true happiness lies. Yet, in the words of this prayer, God's promises exceed all we can desire. It is what God himself has to offer that will make us happy. Not that promotion you've been angling for or the new iPhone coming out. If mere things could give you true lasting happiness, then America would be the happiest place on earth. Well, perhaps our amusement parks can make this boast, or at least one particular amusement park. But I think if you look around, you will see that this is patently not the case. Even before our recent troubles, our country seemed to be sliding into a neurotic funk. Anxiety and depression cloud our thinking. The churches stand empty. The prisons and morgues are full. We're at the boil. Violence and hatred are ever simmering ever ready to explode in a cloud of steam as the joints and fissures of our civic order come unglued. We deny the very nature of reality, preferring instead our own hopeless dreams. We accumulate ever more stuff, faster and more sophisticated machines, bigger houses, better cars, but peace and contentment elude us. contrasts this picture with the lives of God's saints and lands where they do not own much or are perhaps even persecuted. My previous parish was, at that time, part of a diocese of the Church of Uganda, and several of our families had also immigrated from Nigeria. And the stories we heard from both lands were the same. Poverty was rife with people living in conditions we here in America could hardly imagine. And being a Christian could be dangerous. 
The Archbishop of Uganda, who I once met at a meeting, talked about being imprisoned during Idi Amin's reign of terror. And the hardships continue today. Sadly, there are still plenty of headlines about the murder and persecution of Christians in both of these countries. But despite all of this, when travelers return from these nations, you hear the same story. The church there is not struggling. Quite the contrary. The churches are full to overflowing, and they are alive with a palpable sense of joy. But you don't have to take my word for it. Ten minutes spent at the computer will reveal a peculiar discovery. I think you will find that where the church should be most happy because it lives in peace and prosperity, it is actually the most miserable. Members drop away and we are consumed by the worries and desires of this life. On the other hand, believers who should be miserable, those facing near starvation and constant persecution, are happy and their churches thrive despite the best efforts of the enemy to bring them to heal. This seems exceedingly strange from our perspective. But on a smaller scale, don't we see something like this in our everyday lives? Sometimes it feels like the more I have, the more I have to worry about. What would I do if the comfort of my house were taken from me? Or if we lost one of our cars? When I was first married, the term internet hadn't even been coined. Now, I couldn't imagine going 24 hours without access to the web. How would you like to spend a week without your smartphone? I remember my mother reminiscing about the early days of my parents' marriage. My dad was just starting off in his career and there was not much money to go around. And, and I gather things got pretty lean right before payday when the larder and the bank book both stood empty. I remember my mother once talking about serving meat that had gone green, cutting around the bad bits. Hearing this in my comfortable suburban childhood, this seemed horrifying to me. And yet somehow, my parents got through all of that. And you probably have similar stories of your own. Do you remember when you were just starting out and didn't have much? Or perhaps you remember your parents' or grandparents' stories. How could we have been so happy then, we wonder? We didn't have anything. Of course, nostalgia is a powerful drug. and Memory has a way of filtering out the bad parts. But our lives teach us an important lesson. It is not what we have that matters, but who we are with. Our relationships matter far more than any mere things. And there is one relationship that matters most of all. The one we are most likely to neglect. In the final analysis, our happiness, our best hope for true joy, lies not in the things we own or even in the people we know, but in him who made them all. When we remember this, when we renew our love for him who loved us first, we will find true happiness. And in our love, we will be consumed with a zeal to conform to his will, for we will want to draw closer to him. Then we will be eager to have our righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. God is not a distant, glowering force, but a real person. A person who loves you and wants you to know him better. And as you do, in the exciting journey of that relationship, and as that relationship grows, you will find the desire and the strength to grow ever more righteous and holy. Amen. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to just uh, conclude with a uh, couple quick prayers. As we say near the end of our morning prayer service, let's say the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Let us pray, Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time, with one accord, to make our common supplications unto thee. 
and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, that will grant their requests. Fill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you very much once again for joining us in this brief broadcast. Um, we hope that uh, we see you on Sunday upcoming for the Feast of St. James understand for my wife we're going to have a strawberry and rhubarb crisp uh, to match the red color of the day the liturgical day and if you aren't in the area and you are you can't uh, come out yet uh, please join us online and uh, if you would like to get in touch with us email me at anglican rev that's all one word anglican rev as in the rev at gmail.com Thank you very much, and I hope you have a blessed day wherever you are. Goodbye.